so I mean, the basically the idea is to sort of examine what the actual division of labor, the sexual division of labor is among foraging societies, which has implications, mm -hmm. I think. And this is why I think it's so interesting why people were so like why I was seeing it pop up over and over again in all these articles is because I think it, it addresses a couple things, which is it addresses the myths and the stereotypes of what, you know, traditional yeah. labor for men is and what it is for women, males or females, and how that applies yeah. to our contemporary discussions around what is typical, you know, female oriented or women oriented labor versus male, you know, or, or men, right? Because I think what happens, and I just want to just address this point, which is that we tend to do this thing where we justify our current social conditions by yeah. like looking at the past, right? We say, well, this is natural because humans are doing this forever. Men are the hunters. They exactly. have this special like faculties, mental faculties to hunt and women have these other faculties. And it's just like, well, is that really true? Yeah. And so yeah. if I could just, yeah, just ask if you could just, um, yeah, just give us a basic understanding of what this, uh, what this study is, what it, what is it, what is it addressing exactly in the broadest sense? Yeah. So, I mean, exactly, exactly that. And uh, um, again, I think that at the very beginning of this project, I, because I study mobility, the point was simply to look for evidence, um, the type of evidence that existed for female mobility. How are women around the world using their environment in order to gain access to food and resources to provide for their community? And so um, mm -hmm. as we moved into this study, you know, and I and again, you know, and I think also part of it is that when you when you are actually at an anthropology meeting, people will, other researchers will acknowledge that women, can hunt, maybe if the situation is perfect, some of the time opportunistically. Mm, okay. And so I, you know, I've sort of seen these comments, well, we knew that women were hunting all along. And I'm like, kind of. But when you read the sort of the textbooks that are given to new undergraduates whose eyes are being opened to the amazing process of human evolution, Mm -hmm. It will still put forth this idea that on average, humans evolved to hunt and on average, the hunters were all men. Mm -hmm. And then the tools were made by men, the innovations were made by men, the social cohesion was made by men. And again, sure, all of the data that we gathered were from the literature. So... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Clearly, like clearly everything is percolating. Our job was to sort of say, actually, if you take all this percolation, if you take the sum of what everybody is doing and what everybody has been looking at all over the world, actually, this isn't anecdotal. Mm -hmm. There is a pattern of women contributing to their societies in lots of different ways, mm -hmm. lots of ways. Mm -hmm. And one of those ways is also hunting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean the. Uh, could we, yeah, could we, if you, if you don't mind, like describing maybe some of these examples, because I think there is an interesting point in the and what I read in there, which is that not only are women hunting, but the ways and maybe the tactics they they employ differ from men in many cases. I mean, you're you're looking at specific yeah. like forging societies, so they're all going to be different. Yeah. Um, but they're if all you different. could. Yeah, but if you could just kind of maybe give us a, an overview or maybe some specific examples or whatever comes to mind about like, yeah. you know, yeah. So, yeah, so I, there is, and this is what I, I sort of like to come back to is there is a, a huge amount of diversity, um, but on average, um, women tend to hunt in groups and they tend to hunt um, with not just with their husbands, but with their sisters, sometimes multiple ages. They often, um, in some communities, they will hunt with dogs. Um, they use a variety of methods, including snaring, um, as lots of bow and arrows, um, sometimes within a particular community, whereas the males in the community might have um, sort of 
because of the way in which uh, learning is transmitted, they might have sort of one style of hunting. There seems to be more flexibility and females tend to have a, sort of a variety of strategies, whereas they might prefer to hunt with dogs or prefer to hunt with their sister or prefer to use a bow and arrow or prefer to use a machete. And so you see um, a, a sort of a, a, a difference. And people, again, people have been writing about this for quite some time. And there was definitely, a, a, I thought, a really helpful argument in the 1990s that the division, the division of labor is not actually hunting or not hunting. The division of labor is who is making the tools mm -hmm. and which tools are being made and who gets to hunt with the bow and arrow versus who gets to hunt with the spear versus who gets to hunt with some, I mean, at this point, um, guns, though mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that wasn't very common in the, in the papers that we were looking at, but definitely is more common now. Mm -hmm. So that is a, that is definitely an intriguing piece of what of what the literature said. Well, I, I want to um, maybe ask why, where did this notion that men were the hunters and women were the gatherers, where does this notion come from and how has it persisted in, in I mean, because like the data you're, you're collecting here, the data you're looking at is not often new. It's actually been around for a while. You mentioned percolating, right? It's been there. So it really does come down to just these like, very human biases around yeah. gender and and like biological sex and what people are capable of and what people do, right? Well, and I I think what's interesting is that it isn't yes, of course there's that's definitely a huge component. Mm -hmm. But on top of that is also just the notion that that hunting is the thing. I mean, oh, when you yeah. look at our when you look at the paleo record about like what is the magic thing that happens when all of a sudden we see like big brained you know homo mm -hmm. and everyone's like well it has to be hunting i mean there are three awesome things that happen like all at the same time all at the same place and we have evidence for all of them we have evidence for cooking we have evidence for hunting we have evidence for fishing the evidence for fishing fishing is rich and mm -hmm. diverse there's also nutritional arguments that we don't get our brain size without the fats from fish. And so just the whole idea that it's hunting, that is like the major thing, that in of itself is sort of, um, is part of the paradigm. And part of that is, you know, early, early paleontology, they collected the big things. That's what they could see. There was no, you know, screening for the fish bones, screening for the bird bones, um, maybe even only looking for the hominin bones. And so it's only like recently that we have the techniques to really see the high resolution of what's happening in the past. And then, as you've already said, um, there is a notion complicated by how people thought we could understand evolution, mm -hmm. um, that many foraging groups were studied in the 20th century with an eye to find the, the way in which, you know, the earliest, you know, human might have lived. And so um, now, of course, we know that <laughs> humans began with diversity. They began with, you know, explosion of diverse tool types all over Africa. Um, they began with sort of you know, cultural exploration based on both, um, both learning and specific niches. And so the idea that there's one, one culture that is representative of our, you know, our, our most evolved past, that in and of itself is not, um, doesn't seem consistent with, mm -hmm. uh, you know, clearly not the ethnographic literature and definitely not the uh, paleo literature. Mm, yeah. I mean, what, if we, if we actually could talk about maybe some of the, you mentioned some of it there, but uh, if you could describe as far as contemporary understanding goes around, what were some of the main drivers or maybe the, some adaptations or some of the major tools or whatever it is that led to, um, Maybe even like, I mean, 
fitting in within your work with with you know studying locomotion i mean I'm curious, like, what were some of the major things you you mentioned? You know how there was this idea that hunting was the thing that made us human, um, but obviously it's more complex than that, or more diverse than that. So, you know, what maybe were some of the points in which anthropology really had some breakthroughs in this understanding, and how did those come about? Yeah, Do you know what I mean? so multiple things. Yeah, I think so. I mean, there are multiple things at play. Um, one is that I think we are more confident now that um, that humans evolved, uh, you know, in Africa, even though there's obviously tons of debate about how dispersed, um, how dispersals happened. But I think that sort of in answer to your question about the importance of hunting and gathering, a lot of that comes from sort of a, a very Eurocentric view that the, the greatest sort of leap of human evolution was like when humans come into contact with Neanderthals and have this sort of cultural explosion. And now we know that there were, you know, there's cultural explosions all over the place and cultural explosions that happen very early and cultural explosions that happen um, in multiple places around the world sort of at the same, at sim at similar time points. And so um, I think our, our hold onto the, uh, you know, the, the idea of sort of like a European highly seasonal, you need to eat a lot of meat to keep warm, you need furs, like that just sort of almost caveman idea isn't just not consistent with what is happening instead in sort of an earlier time period where we have lots of fishing, lots of cooking, lots of um, uh, transport of really interesting raw materials, hugely long distances, mm -hmm. so that tools seem to gain an increase in importance. Um, you know, all of those things I think we now know evolved very gradually, evolved in a very diverse and rich environment, um, and definitely don't require a sort of caveman approach to uh, the hominin fossil record. Yeah, so it just seems like, uh, would you say that anthropology is kind of undergoing maybe a... a... <laughs> I don't know, there's this sort of notion that there, you mentioned these sort of Eurocentric notions. I'm just curious, like the kind of almost cultural or like, I know this maybe is a little different from what we were maybe intending to discuss in this interview, but it is interesting because I'm not, obviously, I'm not in uh, anthropology. I'm not in academia. I don't know what's going on internally, but I do feel like there's probably these almost push and pulls, these sort of cultural forces almost, or these sort of recognitions. Like, I mean, even just, again, just, just to point to this this research uh, article that you were part of, that you co-authored, it's working with data that already exists. So why is it that That's you right. know certain things just aren't being like certain dots aren't being connected? You know, yeah. and yeah. So and I think that that comes down to I think uh, if I were to be highly simplistic, men dominating mm -hmm. the field, and white men dominating mm -hmm. the field. And that's highly simplistic, yeah. Eurocentric views mixed with kind of a you know male oriented view. Um, has there been more, I guess, has the field become more diverse? Is there something else that's going on that's allowing for anthropology? Because, I mean, frankly, a lot of these scientific disciplines, social sciences, have no <laughs> aspects to them that can be viewed as like from a, com like a colonial perspective is how some would describe Absolutely. it, right? Um, how, how has that changed over time? Yeah, well, um, I think that my guild in particular, the American Association of Biological Anthropology, has worked really hard um, to not just set, po to, well, to set public policies in place mm -hmm. and then to find ways to make sure those policies are acted out. Um, additionally, I think there's just sort of a general like increase in the availability of technology and the professionalization of um, of digs, for lack of a better word, that is allowing sort of a much richer understanding of non-European assemblages to be published and shared and assessed and analyzed. And there have been a lot of amazing people who have pushed really hard to um, 
to sort of, you know, go through the uh, steps of showing what needs to be shown that, you know, behavioral evolution has been slow and gradual and very diverse in different parts of the world. And, um, and that the ways in which people gain access to nutrients um, has also been, you know, people use a lot of different strategies and, and not just one kind of hunting at one time of the year, et cetera, et cetera. So, mm. but it, but on the other hand, it, it also takes, you know, I think that everybody has um, their favorite variable. And so, um, so that also to different studies have different variables because of what people find interesting. And so this one of, I think, the major feedbacks about this particular paper on hunting is that it doesn't operationalize, you know, how many people in the group are actually doing this for how many hours per day mm -hmm. with how many kills per person. And, um, and you just kind of, a lot of those data don't exist because they weren't people's favorite variables. And so they exist mm. for two groups that are not really representative of all the groups. And also then, you know, so for me, I study, um, I study locomotion and mobility. And so for me, what's important is the kind of selection pressure that is constantly acting. So what are people doing almost every single day, almost every single day of their life consistently? Because that sort of daily um, pull on your energy and your well-being, those are the kinds of things that cause gradual changes over time. I mean, there are other there are other things that can happen, um, but the sort of steady state, steady state selection pressures is what I look at. And so, women in most places go out every single day carrying lots of different things. Mm. And on many of those trips, they report that they are going hunting. Mm -hmm. And that is really what we were trying to get at in this study, um, that it's a daily, even if they're not bringing back the largest thing, even if they are going out with more than one person, this is a daily activity that involves part of their group on which they take their children, on which they take their own tools. And that to me seems like selection. It seems like something that is a, a functional and ubiquitous part of many societies, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not every society, because mm -hmm. of course, as I said, there are our databases, even, I mean, we published on the data that we had about hunting. Mm. There's another huge group of um, societies that we read about where hunting just isn't that big of a deal because mm. hunting isn't that big of a deal for all human cultures. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, like the numbers that people are worried about, they're fishing or they're doing something <laughs> right. else. Right. Um, so anyway, those are some of the, those are some of the other issues at play with this conversation. Mm.